the the core of what I, I teach my families and what my team members teach is like one change at a time. And we get success with it before we move on to the next step. Because if mm-hmm. we don't get success, the kid is going to feel like they, they keep falling on their face. It's not working. Parents get super stressed out. And, you know, by doing it like that, we take that pressure off. It's just like, we're in this present moment. We are working on this one adjustment. Right. Like going to the net, like then by making one more change at a time from there mm-hmm. in the positive momentum is, mm-hmm. it's just going to go up exponentially. Welcome back to Mother's Guide Through Autism. Today, I'm speaking with Melissa Doman, and she is coming back because if you are following us, you know that Melissa was here, and we're back because Mother's Guide Through Autism got a lot of great response. There was a lot of interest in the subject of sleep and how to help our kids sleep. And so when when we had that discussion, you and I quickly saw that there was a lot more to talk about. So we are going to talk about sleep and we're gonna get into it a little deeper as far as strategies and, and the how-tos. So if you're listening to this and you're exhausted and you just, you're just at your last bit of energy. Look, I coach moms all the time. And Melissa and I were talking about this before we hit the record button. And we understand there's a lot of fatigue out there for parents. We want to help you. And so I'm going to learn along with you as Melissa is the expert. So I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm really excited to to be here and to talk more depth about about sleep and and actual how to's and strategies. <laughs> yes, because a lot of uh, parents are exhausted out there, and so I'm just gonna go go into this discussion with the how to's. Mm-hmm. So, what is the parents who are listening? So I we're going to talk about, I know routine, we're going to talk about sleep boundaries, like those things. So where's a good starting point if we're looking at steps in the how-tos? Great, great question. So I think the first thing is like for every single family that I work with, doesn't matter child's diagnosis, what the sleep issues are, whatever, we need to, we need to, first of all, set the stage of what's going to happen And we need to start establishing certain consistent language around sleep because most of the time it's something that is weighs super, super heavy on parents, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your child is in on that conversation. Some kids are aware of like, oh, I'm not a great sleeper and mom, (laughs) like I know it from mom and dad. Right. But most of the time they're set and they're comfortable with how things look, regardless of how much weight it bears on parents, how hard it is on them, et cetera. So the first thing that we have to do is this kind of like prep work of setting that stage and and starting to have that consistent language around sleep. So in, in every prep phase for my families, the first step is to do that new and revised routine, which we talked about in the last episode of like, mm-hmm you know, meet our practical needs, but try to meet those sensory needs. And one thing that's really helpful with this is a visual checklist. So just, all right, buddy, this is, this is what we're doing now. Here's our checklist. And you can put little images to go along with it, but anytime we're switching up a normal bedtime routine to enhance it and to make it better, we still need everybody on the same page because there's a lot of steps (laughs) and they can easily get forgotten if parents are super exhausted. And, and with that routine, it is important, like, you know, as many steps of the way as we can, we're giving the child choice. So it feels like their routine. It's not mom or dad telling me I have to do this. I, this is my routine and I get to decide if I want to do sensory swing or puzzles. If I want to brush my teeth 10 times back and forth or eight times back and forth, like, as many places where we can give a child choice and voice, 
they have a lot more fun and they take ownership of that routine. So that's definitely part of the, the prep phase. The second one is introducing a social story around sleep. Okay. So I call these bedtime books. I don't like, I, I use social stories so parents know what they're called, but it's a bedtime book. Um, and my bed, like the bedtime books I, I write for families are written in a very specific way. It's written in third person. So it's not I, we, you language. It's, you know, Harry, mom, dad, grandma, whoever. Right. And I, I think that's very helpful because it kind of takes the kid out of the situation and gives them like that bird's eye view. So mm. it's, we're reading a story about this kid, Harry, even though it is about the kid, but we're reading the story about this kid, Harry, and we're, we're going through that process. And again, establishing language around sleep, because I think over the years, the probably the number one question I get from parents is, will my child understand this process? So we have everything to gain and nothing to lose by in that first week or so saying, we're going to read this social story about sleep two times a day, three times a day, get as much repetition as possible so that when we actually go to make the changes, mm -hmm. they, we, first of all, we've prepared them. We're not pulling the rug out from under them. They, <laughs> they've heard the story about Harry or Susie or whoever for the last week. But, you know, again, like we're, we've been telling them that story and 99% of the time, the kid understands way more than we realize. And that first night when we go to make those hard changes, it's not nearly as stressful as parents or, or, you know, myself or the child even thought it was going to be. Cause again, we've done that prep work. So, you know, I, I highly recommend writing a social story, make it as black and white as possible. Like this is the exact change we're going to make. And I, I recommend also like separating words and pictures. Like it's important that, you know, we have a couple pages that we explain, all right, this is what's happening. And then boom, a picture to illustrate it. A couple more pages, then another picture. That way, at the very least, we know the child's attention is on the words and then the picture. Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario, if we have a kid who's just not going to sit still and listen to it, we can pull the pictures out and just go through the picture. So we still kind of tell the story. We just go a lot faster mm -hmm. or we only... To, you know, go over the first couple pictures and then later on we do the other one, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about that because social stories saved me personally as a parent. Yeah. <laughs> and Joseph, of course, he, he did love books. And so that's why that worked so well. He could actually read before he could speak. Yeah. So that that's unusual, I know. So if I'm tired, exhausted, overwhelmed, is there, you know, other, in a, and I know working with you, of course, yeah. will solve a lot of these questions. And so I know parents are going to, we'll get to that later in the podcast, but for, if you're out on your own yeah. and where do you start like with social stories? So are there, can you use books about sleep or do you need to write them specifically for your routine and dynamic in your family, just some clarity on that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think best case scenario, you're writing it that, so it's specific to your child, your family, your routine, et cetera. Now, a lot of parents that I work with, you know, of course I provide the bedtime book, but they've also like asked their ABA or their OT, like, can we have a book for this? Okay. Um, and I've, I've had parents who have worked with me in the past where the ABA very sweetly wrote a social story about sleep. And, you know, again, like there's a lot of information in it. We just have to pare it down or whatever. Right. So I do encourage parents to like, if you have a therapist who could potentially help you with it, like yeah. get them to do it. Cause at the very least, even if it's not like to the specifications that I've said, at least you got a social story, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because well, the way, and so it, I know that they're, they're, and remember, I'm I'm a what do you call me a veteran? Because <laughs> I did all this a long time ago, right? So I would just do like you know four or five sentences, um, and and I made it really really super simple, so Joseph wouldn't get lost in the directional pieces of it. Like you know what I'm saying? Like because yeah. he and he still does this as a as a man as a grown man more than one directive is really tough. Mm -hmm. 
So that's how, you know, just explaining what social stories do, they really help simplify it and put it in order for the child. Exactly. Yeah. So like, you know, a typical social bedtime book that I wrote for my, write for my kids, it's like, it's time to start sleeping really well. We do our routine. When we're done our routine, we're in bed. This is where mom's going to be. If this happens, then it's morning, right? Mm-hmm. Now there, sometimes there'll be multiple iterations of the social story. So like for my kids who have never slept in the room before, we just yeah. need to write a book of like, Hey, guess what? We're not falling asleep in front of the TV on the couch. Now we sleep in the bed. The bed is for blah, blah, blah. Right. Right. So in that sense, like some parents might have to take a step back from the situation and just kind of look at it in that sense and say, all right, like, what is the first thing that we're going to tackle? So even yeah. if it's only three, four pages long, if you're tackling the one problem that's going to help set a positive precedent for the rest of the, the, the you know, sleep training, you know, I think that can be really helpful, but you know, to go, to go back to what you said, Bridget of like, what about other books? Absolutely. I mean, uh, there's great, there's dozens and dozens of books out there about learning to sleep and, you know, fear of the dark and this issue and that issue. So there, like, if, if you don't have a therapist who can make it, or if you can't make it yourself, yeah, like look, looking at some of those books can be really helpful. And again, it's the same idea. We're reading a story about a child yeah. who's going through this issue. It it becomes a little bit more abstract, mm-hmm. but the the core message is still there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just in case, you know, you've got a parent listening to this that is like, doesn't know what day it is because they're so exhausted. Yeah. What, <laughs> what can I do today? <laughs> yeah. Cause listen, we we've been there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, great, great, great suggestions. Um, and so, yeah, so we've kind of went into the prep time, bit of the routine, the visual checklist. I wanted to, that those are so great again, kind of pairing with social stories. Do you, can, do you make your own depending on what kind of a routine you want? I mean, how, how do you, if I am a parent that's never done a visual checklist, what would I do? Well, yeah. So, I mean, it's from the ones that I make, like, it's usually the same model. It's a checkbox, it's the activity, and then a picture, a little clip art that goes with it. Okay. Now, I keep mine very simple. I know there may even be certain professionals out there who it's like, you need to Velcro it over to make it done. But like in a nighttime routine, it's just like, even mom or dad can just check it off as we go along. It's like, Hey, great job. Like we're done. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We, we got to keep things moving, but at the very least, like even if parents are just taking a copy paper and just writing it out, like, Okay. okay, like, all right. So there's no picture there. The picture's nice, but you know, if parents are walking their child through it and say, Hey, this says brush teeth, we're going to go brush our teeth. This says PJs, let's go get in our PJs. Right. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be super creative. It's just like, write it out. And that alone, I mean, to have a, a tangible item to say like, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're going to follow consistently each and every night is a game changer for a lot of kids. And again, I like to add the pictures because it enhances it and makes it a little bit more fun. But again, if we're in a pinch and we just need to get this thing written down, write it on down. And, and that's that. <laughs> Move on. Move on. Yeah. Exactly. Cause we're, we're making life easier, not harder. Right. Exactly. With all this. So I think just hang on, stick to a plan, start somewhere. Don't get overwhelmed. I wanted to, to move into most common troubleshootings Mm -hmm. and you, you know, we're kind of walking through parents through this. So once we get the prep work done, we've got our social stories, our visual checklist, what might our next step be? Yeah. Well, as I, as I said earlier, like the prep work as as hard it is, as it is, and I know I have parents who push back and they're like, we want to do this right now. And I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, I know you're exhausted. And I know this is a big ask for me to say, wait a week, but you got to do it. You got to do that prep work for a week so that we're making some changes, but we're making easy changes, right? Like, so we're changing the bedtime routine and we're going through it really successfully. So now yeah. your child is feeling like, 
oh, I love, not only do I like this routine, but I'm getting it done and I feel good. And, and this is a great achievement. So mm-hmm. by building that foundation of success, anything that comes after that is going to feel easier for your child. Because again, like we've put that prep work in, we've established that foundation. So it is really important. Like don't skip it. If you're super exhausted and you're like, I got to get this done yesterday, at mm-hmm. least four days. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ideally yeah. a week, but at least four days, if you can give me four days, we're in good shape. Yeah. Um, but yeah. when it comes to like the next step of, all right, so now we've set the stage, we got the prep work in what happens next. It really depends on what the, the sleep situation looks like for your child. Right. And I would say at least 90% of my kids on the spectrum are are dependent on mom or dad in some way to get to sleep. Now that could be co-sleeping in parents' bed. They need, or they need mom or dad in bed with them. Mom and dad might have to just sit out in the hallway and give verbal reassurance, right? So whatever that looks like, we need to evaluate that and see, all right, what's one change we can make to put us in the right direction, right? Mm -hmm. So if we take that example of the child who's co-sleeping in parents' bed from the beginning of the night all through the night, the first step might be like, we move them to their room, but parents are co-sleeping with them in their room. So we've Mm -hmm. made a big change of environment, but Mm -hmm. everything else stays the same, right? Or, you know, a common thing that comes up with my kids is like needing the tablet to go to sleep or like a bottle or a sippy cup or whatever. You know, usually in that it's, we might have to move it up earlier in the routine. So we're still meeting the need, right? Mm -hmm. So if a child needs the tablet to go to sleep, we move it earlier. We give ourselves a bit of a runway where if we can stop it, melatonin can hopefully get dumped in the system naturally. But again, like for a lot of kids, that's a big adjustment. So I might tell parents like, hey, for a few nights, you're going to have to be in there with them to comfort them, Mm -hmm. not having that their like their usual tablet, sippy cup, whatever. Right. So it might seem like a bit of a step back, but by doing that, you're kind of giving child reassurance, like everything's okay. We're going to get through this together. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, ultimately when it comes to getting your child sleeping more independently and with independence, quality greatly increases. Mm -hmm. Um, again, you have to think about what that, what your current situation looks like and decide what's that one change that we're Mm going to make. And you stick to that one change until your child's successful. It's not like you do this for four nights and then we move on to the next one because some kids might need longer amounts of time. So if you have a child that's been co-sleeping in your bed for six years, you might have to spend a week in their bed, in their room, (laughs) co-sleeping, right? Before we go to make that next adjustment. But, you know, the the core of what I, I teach my families and what my team members teach is like, one change at a time. And we get success with it before we move on to the next step. Because if Mm -hmm. we don't get success, the kid is going to feel like they, they keep falling on their face. It's not working. Parents get super stressed out. And, you know, by doing it like that, we take that pressure off. It's just like, we're in this present moment. We are working on this one adjustment, right? Like going to the next, like then by making one more change at a time from there, Mm -hmm. it, positive momentum is, Mm -hmm. it's just going to go up exponentially. It's just usually those first two or three phases are the the toughest ones. Um, Yeah. Because it's just, it's not only habit changing for the child, it's habit changing for parents too. Like I, the amount of conversations I've had of like, now remember you're not doing this at 3 a.m. You got to stop doing that. And then, you know, I get that call the next day. It's like, we did it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's it's so hard. It's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. Yeah. So it happens. But but again, we also have to to give not only the child grace, but parents grace of like, look, there's a lot of habits that we're you are reteaching yourself in this process too. Right. Um, and, right. And there are going to be bumps in the road. But mm-hmm. you know, I, I think when it comes to like post prep work, what's that next step? Yeah. Parents just have to keep that in mind one change at a time and wait for success with it. Whatever success might look like just wait for that one night of success before we make that next adjustment. Yeah. I think that's very wise because most of the moms that I talk to are extremely overwhelmed. And I think that may, it may sound a little daunting to go, Oh my gosh, that I have to do this for, I don't know how long, but 
if we can keep the big picture change yeah. and that life is going to get so much better with everyone getting rest, just stick, stick. If you can just stick to the plan is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. At a time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's important to, to hear. And I like how you break it down. I think that's really important too. You know, one small change at a time, stick to it, stick to it. Um, I was curious when they do, when they do get to the other side with even one small change, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you have like behavior? Like, do they get rewards? Like, like parents ask me that all the time. Like, do I, what do I do? You know? And so I was curious what your thoughts were on that. Well, again, it kind of depends from kid to kid and and family to family. I mean, more than half of the time, parents are like, do we have to do rewards? Because we've been doing it with ABA and potty training. It's like, we're just reward fatigued. Like there's there's literally nothing else we can use or, you know, and and my philosophy with rewards is like, if we're going to reward something, that reward should only be for that thing. Cause if the ch- child knows, like, I'm just going to get tablet later for going pee pee in the potty. Like, yeah, fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to that one. Night, right. It's not as effective, but again, a lot of parents specifically with kids on the spectrum, because rewards is so commonly used in other therapies, they're just like, do we have to? And I'm like, no, we don't have to. It's okay. Right. Now my approach, like there has to be a way for us to acknowledge and celebrate what the child has done well. So yeah. Typically what I do is like, you know, we kind of break it down. There's maybe three or four things that we could say, Hey, you did a great job with this. Right. So usually it's like, you did your routine, you stayed in bed, you were quiet, you stayed in bed until morning. So like mom came in and they they were still in their room. Right. So what I, you know, so I have parents make this checklist and the next day we, we sit down and we say, all right, look, buddy, let's go through what happened last night. Did we do our routine? Yes, we did. Absolutely. Check that off. Did you stay in bed? Well, you got out of bed eight times last night, so we can't put a check mark there, but, but you were very quiet, right? Like you were like a ninja. You (laughs) managed to get in the room. I had no idea. So we could say that they're quiet. So it's a way for us to acknowledge the things that they've done well without keeping it, like without being negative about it. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, like in those really difficult nights, there's got to be something that we can celebrate. And it's not right. just for the kid, it's for parents. Like, you know, it, you know, if that checklist was like, all right, they got out of bed 10 times, they screamed the house down and then, you know, they were in my room again at 4 a.m. Like I can't give any check marks, but we did do the routine and we had a good time with it, right? Yeah. So it's it's not only for the kid, but it's for the the parent to to find that moment of like, what can we celebrate even in those really challenging times? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it's a system I've used basically since the pandemic. Cause even before that, I occasionally would need to use a consequence system with certain kids. And it was just like, you know, if you're jumping around in your bed and you're not lying down, like mom's just going to leave for a few seconds, let yourself collect, <laughs> get yourself to help to collect a little bit, and then we'll come back in. But a- after the pandemic, like, things just shifted. And I was like, there's, it's unfair for me to keep using this consequence system when all of the world is just going crazy. But on the deeper level too, it's like, can we really consequence a kid for not having a certain skill? Like they just don't know how to do it. Right. Right. So, you know, so for me, like that was a huge shift and, you know, again, like exponentially things were great before that, but like after that, like exponentially things got better. Cause it's like, why, why, why are we doing this to a kid? And for a lot of kids on my, on the spectrum, the common issue we kept running into was just like starting to go into meltdowns and we didn't want that either. So, so anyway, so like, I I think it's a great way for us again, to kind of acknowledge what the child's done. Well, it's a man, a way for parents to celebrate even in the toughest moments, what, what went well the night before. And it's a way for us to do it with, while we're still teaching the skill. We're not doing consequences. And, and look, if parents want to put a reward on it, great, put a reward on it, you know, for, for that like little checklist system, you know, the first kid I ever did it with, he loved train videos. I was like, great. You know what you're going to do? 
Two check marks means 10 minutes of train videos. All four means 25 minutes, right? Like, so we put it like a crazy number on it, but he was like, he got that in two seconds. He was like, all right, cool. I'm on it. Like that's, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And that mom was really smart too. because she, Not only did she do the checklist, she had a video monitor in the room and she would pull up the recording from the night before. And she'd say, Hey buddy, like you see how you got out of bed and you, you went around in circles. Like I can't give a check mark for getting out of bed. Right. So right. And he, he, like, I, I was just, she did that on her own. I was like, that's a great idea, but it is. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's like the third eye, right? Like he can actually see, like you yeah. said, social stories in third person. Well, there you are. What? Yeah. Uh, there, there, there I am. <laughs> there I am. There I am getting out of bed and going, going yeah. for goldfish because that's what he would do. Oh. Goldfish crackers. But but if you didn't want to do a reward, even just doing the checklist, like and having that celebration together for most kids, yeah. like that's enough. They're like, all right old girl seems to be happy with how I did last night. Like maybe I should keep doing that because mom, like she's so happy. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that alone is great. Uh, other families have used, like they'll get little stickers or badges. So when they go through the checklist, they're like, okay, let's say, you know, Adrian got out of bed four times last night instead of the usual eight. Great. Celebrate it, put it up on the fridge. Like, and then, you know, you've got those stickers and those little badges yeah. in a place where the child can come by and sell it, see like, look how great I'm doing. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's, that's great. Simple, Yeah, simple, but effective. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Those are all like, I was just, when, when you're getting all these examples, I think back to Joseph and I was just like, wow. Yeah. And, and Joseph really responded well to just like, great job. Like yeah. I could say that and the kid just lit up. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So, yeah. I mean, there's, there's just, they just want to know, they just want that reinforcement, whatever, whatever it is. So yeah. Yeah. simple. Yeah. Simple, simple. So then we get, we're moving along. We we're humming along and then we get middle of the night sleep wake ups and like all the examples you just gave. Like, I love the video idea too, yeah. that the mom did. What are some, some great strategies for that sort of those moments? Yeah. Well, well, look on my, on my checklist that I provide families when, when it's time, you know, I mentioned three things of like staying in bed, being quiet, staying in bed till morning. These are probably the most three common troubleshoots that come up. So there's a reason that they're on that checklist because most kids I work with, it's either one up or all of those issues. Right. Yeah. So is that kind of like the same thing as creating sleep boundaries? Do yes. those go hand in hand? Exactly. Yeah. So, so when we establish what that new chain, like what that one change is, that's mm -hmm. our new boundary, right? More for parents just to say like, buddy, I'm not lying down with you anymore. Sorry, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Time's up. Um, yeah. But, but it's a way for us to teach boundaries, but to do it in a very positive way. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and we don't, you know, there's no discussion about it at 3 a.m. when they've gotten out of bed six times. It's not like, you know, you're not getting your reward. It's like, we're talking about that tomorrow. I need, we need to focus in right now as to what's happening. And I would say like, for those like most common troubleshoots, those three things, number one, and this is hard, is to stay neutral. Like, we're not going to get upset with the, you know, with your child. We're not going to get angry because then, any rules or boundaries you're trying to establish are null and void because you've lost it. Like you've gone over the boundary at that point. So you have to try and stay neutral. But that also means like when they've come to your room six or seven, like for the sixth or seventh time, we're not picking them up and like tucking them in bed and giving them hugs and kisses because what kid wouldn't want to keep waking up to get that? Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, um, and this is a sneaky thing. Like I, there are times I just had this with a family, like, we're five, six weeks in. And I'm like, why are they continuing to get out of bed? And then mom was, you know, mom will say, or dad will say like, well, you know, we do give them a kiss every time they get out of bed and, you know, we pick them up and I'm like, oh, okay, that that's, that's it right there. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so if you have a child who's like frequently getting out of the room and coming to find you or getting into places that they shouldn't, the idea is like, you remind them we're, we're, 
supposed to be in our room right now, right? And if anything, you're walking them back, either they're side by side with you, holding hands, you're behind them, guiding them by their shoulder, bringing them to their room. And whatever you did in the beginning of the night, right? So if you were, you know, sitting on the edge of the bed or you were, you know, lying down with them to get them to sleep, you have to do that middle of the night because their brain needs to start picking up on like, oh, the way I did it in the beginning is how I keep putting myself back to sleep, right? Okay. So, it, you know, again, if you have a child who's like frequently leaving, walk them back, you know, give them as, as the help that they need to get back into bed. But then wherever you were beginning of the night, you, you mimic that until they fall back asleep. And again, we talk about it the next day. We say, hey, buddy, you got out of bed six times last night. Like mm -hmm. we're, we're working on only getting out of bed three times, right? Or something yeah. like that. Right. Um, now, if your child is is one of those kids who has the big, long wake ups, like seemingly you could give them the tablet and a thousand snacks and they're not falling asleep. That's a different situation. That's a situation where their brain and body is just it's up. It's having a hard time getting getting the message of going back to sleep. Right. And we and we talked about that in the first episode as well of like the sensory things that are involved and stuff like that. But at the very least, if your child is struggling with that big middle of the night wake up, the, one of the best things that you can do is a bedtime routine reset. So, you know, 45 minutes, an hour in, if it's just not happening, take two or three things from the bedtime routine and repeat it. And it's meant to send the message to the brain like, okay, these are the things we do in our routine. Then we're lying back down into bed. So maybe, maybe it's time for us to go back to sleep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you should probably pick the same two or three things. Like don't, it's not going to change from night to night. It could be mm -hmm. some families actually do a quick tooth, teeth brushing because that just works. So you take them out of the room to the bathroom. Maybe they do potty. We do a little brushing of the teeth. We come back to the room. We read a couple pages from the last book we read before bed. And then we start the process over again, right? Mm -hmm. So your child's not trying to drive you crazy. It's just neurologically, they're not like something has disrupted them. Mm -hmm. And what that is, we got to figure out during the daytime. But in that very moment, try that routine reset with them. Okay. okay. Try to routine reset. And at the very least, they're going to get back into bed feeling more calm and more settled. Best case scenario, it does exactly what it's supposed to of the brain picks up on the patterns mm -hmm. and the child goes back to sleep. Yeah, that's important. So out of all these things, which every single uh, bullet or whatever item topic we talked about in this behavior change mm. and strategies, I think it sounds like routine is pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, we, it, so it make is. sure your routine is something you can stick to. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I know for a lot of, of autism parents, sometimes they can get a little prickly about routine because they don't want to create rigidity for their child. Right. Like that, right. that's a very common concern for my families of like, if we follow the same routine all the time, are they going to become rigid? And the answer is no, we have to, we have to put that routine in and first and establish with your child, like, this is what to expect. Right. And from there, they, you know, they, they start to develop their own flexibilities, but they, but again, that comes from a place of, I have a routine, we've stuck to it consistently and I feel successful with it. Right. Yeah. And again, it's, it's that me mentality and that philosophy of build on success, but it's, it's also a very important reason why in the bedtime routine itself, we put yeah. choices in. So yes, we have this umbrella activity, but we can choose what that activity is going to be each and every yeah. night. So it, it, there is flexibility in that sense. But again, depending on what your child's sleep struggles have been and what yeah. this, the current sleep situation looks like, yeah, like the routine and consistency of it, it's, it's the most challenging part of it, but it's, it's the one-way ticket to making significant impact and, and lasting changes and how your child is going to sleep. Yeah. Staying to sleep. Yeah. I think this, that, that it's so, it's so important. It's such an important topic because again, without the rest, it, you know, that that's just no way to live. Yeah. That, that's horrible. 
<laughs> you know, to be sleep deprived for, and it's not healthy. And there's so many, so many reasons why it's important yeah. to just go the course and stick to it. Exactly. And, and, and the autism parenting, the special needs parenting journey, it's, it's a marathon. And if you are not taking those moments to reflect on yourself and the situation, it's like, what, what can I be doing as a parent to mm -hmm. really be present and to be the best I can be for my child? Cause again, it's, it's the long haul. Like there's, you know, we never know what it's going to look like 20, 30 years from now, but right whatever you can be doing at this moment to, to check in on your health and, and make sure you're getting a good night's rest, you're eating what you need to, yeah. it's going to be easier to eat healthier and eat what you need to, if you're sleeping better. <laughs> yeah. Cause when I'm tired, I'm like, I don't even care. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. You know, it's it's give mess. me something. <laughs> it's a mess. Yeah, it is. Um, it's just like this spiral, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But you know, it, it's, and, and I know like when I have that first call with parents, it's so much of the focus is on the kid, but you know, I, I encourage parents to be thinking about it for themselves as well. And even just last week, I had a call with a mom. She was like, you know, I started dating again and I'd like to be able to stay over at my boyfriend's place. And I'm like, yeah, that's perfect. All right. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> We're working <laughs> towards that, <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's, yeah I, I just like, I, I encourage parents like to, to maybe as, as hokey as it sounds, like just let go of the guilt of it and just say, you know, my boundary now is like, I want to be rested and I want to be, you know, I want to be healthy or whatever that is like that, that is your new boundary. And when parents establish the boundary on themselves, the, the, I, I don't know what the, how I want to say it, but like, kind of like the spiritual ripple effects or, yeah. you know, the, the vibe that the, the child picks up on is like, oh, this is different. This is mom saying, I need this for myself. It's not a boundary on me. It's right. mom showing by example, like this is, this is my boundary now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And, and, I, and I get that it's hard for moms to make that mind shift, but it is essential. And that's, you know, what I talk about because I didn't do it. Mm. And as a result, you know, your, your body starts speaking to you. So it, it really is, it's, it's hard to make the shift, but if you can do it, oh my goodness, your everything then just starts to fall into place. Things that, that they're not to say that you won't have struggles or that there aren't things that come up in life that aren't hard, Yeah, but they won't be as hard if you can learn how to do that. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Okay. So, whoa, we cut, we did it again. We, I could talk to you. Oh, there, there's so much to, to ask and learn, but you know, we don't want to overwhelm our listeners either. So is there anything else that you want to mention before we go? No, I mean, I, I think we covered, I think we covered most of it. And again, like I guess the last thing I want to say is, you know, like I said before, the routine and consistency is the most challenging, but the the most important aspect of all of this. And, you know, what I always say to parents is like, when you go to make those changes, it's a roller coaster at first. Like, don't be surprised if like, I have this a lot. Kids start off great night one and two, and then three and four. It's like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Or yeah. it's just like really, really tough the first few nights. And then we start to see that click. So like, just because it takes three, four nights for, to see that initial success, or it takes longer than that, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. It's just that every kid, they process and they understand these changes at their own pace. So be patient, be patient and don't, you know, as, as, it, it can feel stressful. And it, when we're in those air, times of stress, it's like, we got to make a change. Right. But you have to, if you got to write it on a piece of paper or whatever, like just have a reminder to yourself, like be patient, be consistent. It's, it's going to fall into place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I think probably that's like the most common mistake parents make, you know, when they've tried to do it on their own, they just, they don't stick to it long enough. And I asked that question very specifically in my first call with parents, like, so you said you just tried sleep training. How many nights did you give it? And usually it's like two, three. And that's like, yeah, not, <laughs> enough. not enough. 
<laughs> yeah. You, now, every once in a while, I will get a parent who is like, we did it for a two sol like solid two weeks and we didn't move the needle. And it's like, great. I'm glad you reached out to me. Like, let's, <laughs> let's yeah. figure out what happened. But 95% of the time, it's like two, three nights and parents throw in the towel. And, you know, again, as, as a reminder to all of you out there, regardless of what changes you make, just be patient. It's, it's going to happen. You just, sometimes you got to put the work in and kind of like take that step back and just say, all right, it's one night at a time here. Yeah. Yeah. So now we get to the, the, we've got everybody like help, help. I need more. Where can people go? Like if, if I'm listening to this podcast mm -hmm. and I want to work with you, Melissa, yeah. what do I do? So look, the, I think the best place to go is to go to the website. So melissadomansleepconsulting.com. There's a link at the very top to schedule a call with us to just talk about like what the heck is going on with your kid's sleep. And our, our goal in those sessions is to, to get more information and to educate parents and to teach them like you've given us this information. This is most likely why we're seeing these current sleep issues. Like it's not like I want parents to leave that call knowing why it's happening because most parents they're just like what the what the what is going on and I don't yeah. understand why and no one's been able to explain it to them right so like at the very least you know go to the website you can book a call or on the website itself you can just with your name and email address we'll send you five tips specifically for kids on the spectrum like what to get started with and okay. some of the things we've talked about in the this show and the previous one but in the the little booklet that you get it takes you to a link where you can see a sample checklist it takes you to our checklist generator so it, like there's a two page you know few page document i made where it's like blank checklist but then all the possible routine things and the clip art that goes with it. So parents, all they have to do is cut, paste and drag it up um, mm -hmm. among other things. There's plenty of other recommendations in it, but you know, I, I, I guess what I want to say to the parents is like, whether regardless of which path you go, if you're just kind of interested in like working on some things at home on your, on your own, or you're just like, yep, we got to get a call now. I want to do it now. You know, we're, we're here to help. And there's, there's no reason, there's no reason to continue suffering through this and, 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 you know, just kind of running on fumes. Like there is an answer to your child's sleep issues. And, and sometimes it's going to resolve itself faster than others. But, you know, again, like it, there's a lot of really simple things that we can put into place that make huge impacts when it comes to overall quality of sleep and, independence and, and all of that. So there, there are definitely answers out there. And, you know, like I said, my team and I are here to help with any, any questions or concerns that parents have. That's wonderful. I'm, it sounds simple enough, anyone who needs help out there and we'll give that information to you all as we release this podcast. So no worries there. And, you know, uh, I hope you sleep good <laughs> in the real yeah. near future, you know? So, yeah. Well, thank you so, so much for coming back and spending this time with me. I've learned so much from you in both episodes. I'm sure we will drum more conversations <laughs> up because there's so much, there's a, a lot of times there's more questions than answers at first, yeah. but the, the key, the, to sum it up, just meet yourself where you're at one small step at a time and just know that this too shall pass. You will sleep again. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And if you enjoyed this episode and Joseph and I, as you all know, are really trying to reach as many folks as we can to spread knowledge, hope, and inspiration. Please like and please subscribe to this podcast and let us know if you have questions. Let us know what's going on out there. I'll see you all in the next episode.